So we are really, really looking forward to inviting Pastor Arwell forward. So why don't we give Arwell a big round of applause? Yeah. <laughs> and um, Arwell is going to be sharing from Psalm 11, verse 3 today, and it's entitled Building Maintenance. And it's going to be part one of part of two parter, isn't it? So let me tell you, sometimes Arwell emails me and he says, Dave, I feel like this is going to lead into a two parter. And let me tell you, it's one of the most joyous emails that I can get <laughs> because it means that there's a week where I don't need to prepare another sermon. So I'm always delighted when I get those. I mean, you can feel free to turn it into a three parter. Why not? You know, the Trinity, we can see what it leads. Yeah, who knows? But um, hey, let's pray for Arwell just as he comes. So, Lord, we want to thank you for Arwell. I want to thank you for the gifting that he has and the heart that he has to share that with the body. Like we talked about earlier, we just thank you for each and every body part and their, the way that we can use them together to um, come together as your body. And we just are going to be listening to Arwell today share. Hopefully, um, he's going to be using his own words, but we know your Holy Spirit's going to come grab hold of them and implant them firmly within us. And we just pray as that happens that real seed will go into our life and just grow and bloom and blossom into something beautiful from what he shares. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I learned um, two things last week. Um, and after the micro messages, I'm afraid you're gonna to have to have a macro message this morning. <laughs> But I did learn from, from the young people, weren't they good? But at my age, it takes longer to absorb, so you'll have to wait for the next one. I'll share with what I've learned. The other thing I've learned um, is observing Pastor David over the last um, few preaches. He li rather likes quirky titles, doesn't he? So I thought I'd try my hand. <laughs> Building maintenance. You know, um, some decorating is needed doing, and probably new carpets, and some woodwork to be repaired. It seemed rather appropriate, um, but actually I don't want to talk about anything like that. <laughs> I'm going to read um, Psalm 11. I'm going to read it all, because it's quite short, and I'm reading from the Passion Version. Lord... Don't you hear what my well-meaning friends keep saying to me? Run away while you can. Fly away like a bird to hide in the mountains for safety. For your enemies have prepared a trap for you. They plan to destroy you with their slander and deceitful lies. Can't you see them hiding in their place of darkness and shadows? They're set against you and all those who live upright lives. But... Don't they know, Lord, and this is David speaking now, that I have made you my only hiding place? Don't they know that I always trust in you? What can the righteous accomplish when truth's pillars are destroyed and law and order collapse? Yet the Eternal One is never shaken. He is still found in his temple of holiness, reigning as Lord and King over all. He is closely watching everything that happens, and with a glance his eyes examine every heart. For his heavenly rule will prevail over all. He will test both the righteous and the wicked, exposing each heart. God's very soul detests those who love to resort to violence. He will rain down upon them judgment for their sins. A scorching wind will be their portion and lot in life. But remember this, the righteous Lord loves what is right and just, and every godly one will come into his presence and gaze upon his face. So verse 3, what can the righteous accomplish when truth's pillars are destroyed and law and order collapse, or as some other translations have it, what can a righteous person do when the foundations are undermined? So there is some maintenance of the building required, because we all have foundations in our life, don't we? But here in this psalm, David, who is the writer, 
is under attack from unnamed enemies. We don't know who they are, and in a way it doesn't matter. And by those who should know better, he's been advised to flee, to seek refuge in the mountain, like a bird flies swiftly. You can hear them saying, you know, um, you're rich, David, you're the king. Um, time to get the Ferrari out of the garage. Hit the motorway, never mind about speed limits, and get up into the mountains as fast as you can, and you'll be safe there. It reminds me a little of the Amish community in the States who try to live withdrawn from secular society. And also, and this perhaps is a bit of a stretch, a term used by GPs about patients who present themselves regularly with vague symptoms. They call them the worried well. In other words, nothing's really wrong, but they're just anxious about their health. But David the psalmist is wider than the stalwarts of the faith. He is king of Israel after all. And he expresses confidence in the God he serves, whose character, regardless of what's happening around, has not changed. And his only true source of refuge and protection, and that remains true today for us. Fear and doubt and not the marks of true believers, the righteous. So that brings me neatly to the righteous. All else will flow from this, so I'm starting here. Who are the righteous? Well, scoop, hold the front page. It's you. And even more surprisingly, it's me. <laughs> no way, you might say. I still wrestle with temptation. I still fail the Lord. I can see tabloid head headlines, shock, the righteous still fail. They still struggle to live right. How then can they claim to be holy? Surely only God is righteous. Okay, I'm fantasizing a bit. I can't imagine our mass media ever running a story like that, but you get my point. Often we're the first to criticize ourselves, to put ourselves down. We're all too aware of our own faults and perhaps a little frustrated when we keep repeating them. So how can we claim to be righteous? Surely that's God alone. The psalmist says in Psalm 89, righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Or you might quote at me, Paul, in Romans 3.10, no one is righteous, not even one. But Paul is speaking of those who've not accepted Christ as Savior, not those who have. And what we need perhaps to remember rather than learn is that we don't acquire righteousness as we grow into God and as we grow in grace. Theologically, righteousness is imputed to us. That's the theological word. And that happens, it's from God himself, at the point that we accept his son as our savior. God then says, you are now my righteous people. Not later, instantly, at that point. And we do not achieve righteousness. We all want to live better. We all have implanted in us by the Spirit an instinct about what we should do, how we should behave, what we should think. But even if we tick all those boxes, it doesn't mean suddenly we've achieved righteousness. We were righteous before. It's nothing to do with us. We're counted and viewed as righteous by God himself. Romans 1, verse 17. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. And Joyce Mayer comments on that verse. When God calls us righteous, she says, 
we enter into a relationship of love, confidence, and friendship. We need not fear or worry because there is no longer any punishment for us. At its simplest, you could define righteousness as being right with God. I suppose we've all had experience where we've fallen out with a friend or we've offended someone. And then we take steps to make it right. And often we will say, are we all right now? Well, the moment we come to Jesus in faith, we're all right with God. Amazing, isn't it? Richard Hooker writes, count it folly, frenzy, or whatever. We care for no knowledge in the world but this, that a man has sinned and God has suffered, that God has made himself the sin of men and that men are made the righteousness of God. Of course, there remains a growing in grace through our lives, doesn't it? Isn't there? It's known as sanctification. But righteousness precedes sanctification. It's not like so often in our job. It's not result, righteousness is not results-based. It's a gift from God. And it's described to us at the outset of our journey of faith. And I think if it hadn't been that way, our journey of faith might have foundered quite early. Because the righteousness of God brings us into a deeper relationship with the Lord. And in all trials, all temptations, we can draw on that intimate relationship, find strength, and go on from strength to strength. Righteousness is ascribed to us at the outset of our journey of faith, not at its termination. We don't earn it. We receive it through faith in the Savior Jesus. Of course, and this is the frustration, it doesn't mean we never fail afterwards. That somehow we've acquired sinless perfection. But it does mean we're endowed with insight that makes us sensitive to sin. And with the power to overcome temptation. And with the grace to seek forgiveness when we fail and fall. And so, that's us if we've given our life to Jesus. It's us and all believers. Together, we constitute Christ's worldwide community of the righteous, his new family. Having established who the righteous are and what righteousness is, I think it becomes easier to define our foundations, which is the next key point in this. What are our foundations? What do we build our lives upon? Now, at this point, you might expect me to turn to Jesus' parable of the foolish builder who built a house on sand only to have it collapse around him when the storm came. But that's not really a perfect analogy for what I'm talking about this morning because the house he built had no foundations. The foundations of our life exist and it's the foundations that are being undermined. As being righteous is a spiritual matter, so our foundations must be as well. So on what are our lives built? I can summarize them like this. Existence of an all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God of goodness, grace, and love. Secondly, opportunity to know this God as Father through faith in his Son, Jesus Christ, and through this relationship, power to live right. And third, access to this relationship through the agency of God's Holy Spirit, through faith in Jesus Christ to eternal life after physical death. There are other things we hold dear, of course. Um, but for me, they're more amplifications of these essentials. It's all summed up in the old hymn. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. And there's a more modern version, isn't there, with the Hillsong song, uh, Cornerstone. I know I'm mixing the metaphor a bit because foundations are not a cornerstone, but they go together. 
And these are the foundations that are now being undermined, and to which I turn next. But before I talk about the spiritual foundations that are under attack, let me just acknowledge that society's foundations are also being undermined. And that too impacts our lives. For example, law and order, no respect for the police anymore. And six police forces are under special measures, being observed, being counted, including the Met, which is supposed to be the paramount agency of law and order in the country. And then there's wokeism, dreadful word. And I saw just this week that the Duke and Duchess of Woke are going to grace us with a visit again, um, which I don't think we actually wanted, but there you go. And then gender choice, freedom of speech under attack, integrity in public life, politics and royalty, greed in business, bosses pay, profiteering by companies, and world peace, to which we can add now the soaring cost of living, energy shortages, strikes, drought. <laughs> Cheerful message, isn't it? <laughs> but that's not going to be my main focus, so stay with me. You know, don't stone me yet. But let me add this. In the crumbling foundations of our society, we must not forget God's role. Hebrews 12, 25 onwards, and I'm reading the New Living Translation. Be careful you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. Now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worship, worshiping him with holy fear and awe for our God is a devouring fire. But now the main focus, our Christian foundations are also under attack. Spiritual assault. We face these sort of statements. God doesn't exist. And if he did, did he just certainly doesn't care about human lives and suffering, or he put a stop to it. Or perhaps you've heard, all religions are fairy tales. As Marx famously labeled it, the opiate of the people. And are the root cause of every global conflict. It's ridiculous to insist that Christianity is the only one route to God. It's pathetic to believe humans can have a personal relationship with a heavenly being. Who you may talk with, hear from, be guided by. And heaven, eternity, surely that's for the fairies. Life here and now is all there is, so get real. You probably heard that or versions thereof. It's probably never, ever been truly easy to advocate for Christianity. But opposition now seems to be expressed more heatedly and openly, and the kickback certainly is more pervasive, or seems that way anyway, and forceful, making it ever more difficult to speak for, stand up for truth in public. I listened recently to an interview with Rick Warren, who's just stepped down from leadership of Saddleback Church, as you probably have heard, um, having built it up from scratch. He was speaking about the marks of a mature church and of a mature Christian. And both, he said, involve new birth. 
For a mature church, there must be children churches. For a mature Christian, there must be new converts. And then he went on to say, and this is what really hit me, he'd found that too many of us have never spoken to our neighbor about faith. And I'm the first to put my hand up on that one. Got a little close this morning when our neighbors were out walking the dog and saw us getting in the car. And the dog, bless him, because Anne walks him every week, bounded up to us, jumping, whining, barking, glad to see us. And I said to him, oh, do you want to come to church with us? Um, unfortunately, it didn't open up the sort of conversation I hoped, but there you go. That's my pathetic effort. And Anne drew my attention to a new movement from the U.S. recently. And aren't all these movements from the U.S.? Sorry, Jared and Stevie, but... <laughs> its adherents label it progressive Christianity. Have you heard about it? Yeah. And their website... You know, it says things like this. We believe that following the path of the teacher Jesus, now there's the first warning sign, not the savior Jesus, the teacher Jesus, can lead to healing and wholeness, a mystical connection to God and gods in inverted commas. But that his teachings provide but one of many ways to experience the sacredness, oneness, and unity of life. And that we can draw from diverse sources of wisdom, including earth, whatever that means, in our spiritual journey. Another one says this. We seek to create community that is inclusive of all in block capitals, including, but not limited to, conventional Christians and questioning skeptics believers and agnostics, those of all sexual orientations and gender identities, all creatures and plant life. I have to confess, we've neglected to bring our plants to church. <laughs> they might be healthier, perhaps, if, they, if we did. And this is the third one. Grace is to be found in the search for understanding, not in the discovery of it. There is more value in questioning with an open mind and open heart than in absolutes or dogma. And that's being progressive. But like so many new movements, there's nothing new there. It has flavors of ancient heresies, such as antinomianism, Gnosticism, pantheism, and universalism. There are all flavors of that there. But it brings home to me that our Christian foundations are being undermined from within as well as from without. And that brings me to what the righteous, and remember, that's you and me, should do faced with this. Human beings, naturally, confronted with danger, we're wired, so the psychologists say, to fight or flight. And there's a case for both in the spiritual. Flight, as a frightened child seeks protection, reassurance from a parent, or as we might seek refuge in a storm. I spoke last time about how God is our only true refuge, but now I'm fo focusing on what follows from that, because we're not called to hide away permanently, even in God. As P.T. Forsyth says, God's solution to the psalmist question, this is in Psalm 11.3, is not really an answer to a riddle, but victory in battle. When the danger has passed, when we have been comforted, reassured, when we have been built up, it's time to return to daily life and attend to the foundations. Note in our text the simple word, do. It's a verb. 
And as a child, I was taught that a verb is a doing word, whereas a noun is a naming word. Here endeth the free grammar lesson. <laughs> Christians are not called to the hermit life, hidden away in a cave in the desert, or the monastic life withdrawn from the world's contamination. We are in the world, though we're not of the world. And as citizens of the world, we should take our stand and fight for the truth. So what does that look like in the face of attacks on the foundations of our faith? Well, first, let's remind ourselves we're not on our own. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, and the presence of Jesus is therefore made real in our lives. And through that presence, we're equipped with boldness, guidance, and wisdom. Or perhaps, I should say, we should be like that. The trouble is, as Billy Graham is said to have responded to someone who asked, hearing him pray, to be filled with the Spirit, but Billy, I thought you had been filled. Yes, the evangelist replied, but I leak. So we too need to be continually filled, replenished with God's Holy Spirit. And here's a question to leave hanging with all of us. When did you last have such an experience? Second, we're members of the worldwide community, the household of faith. And this is evidenced even by our church family here in Aberdeen and our personal relationships with Christians in other fellowships across the city. I counted that we have friends in at least six other churches around the city, all of which may be called upon in times of need. And also, through some of our, our own people here, we have connections with the wider Christian community. Through Eno, we have connections with Bible Study Fellowship, mainly the ladies. Through Stevie, with Bethany Christian Trust. Through David and Christian, Kirsten, Kristen, <laughs> with New Life Trust. And as David has been talking about, through Food Bank, with those outside. Next, we're not let, left defenseless. We're equipped with the armor of God. Remind yourself in Ephesians 6 about the elements of that. So what's all this look like when translated into everyday life and action? Well, we assert our beliefs when opportunity presents, including on social issues. We don't hide away. We live as God's representatives in the workplace, in community, and in our families, not just in church. The face of Jesus Christ, we are, to a world of darkness. And we don't close our eyes to need, like the religious leaders in Jesus' parable who ignored an injured man on the road for fear of contamination. We have to get down and dirty sometimes. And of course, we're called to witness. Not rely on example alone, as I'm very fond of doing, too fond of doing. Too often I hide behind the advice that was said to have been given by St. Francis of Assisi to his friars. Go and preach the gospel, use words if necessary. In my experience, words are usually needed. So in conclusion, Individually, we are to ensure our personal foundations, faith foundations, are sound. And through regular fellowship, worship, prayer, life groups, we encourage and strengthen each other in that task. Individually and collectively, we fight back against the assault on our beliefs and values, not with force and anger, but through acts of compassion towards the lost and suffering. To do so, we need to ensure we're fully equipped for the task. In other words, filled with the Spirit of God. Because failure surely lies in attempting what I've been talking about in our own strength. In other words, we look within, but reach out. If we truly want more of God, we have to make room for Him in our lives. And we do that by giving away what he has given to us, materially and spiritually. 
Anything other than that will block the flow of his spirit in and through us. It's going to become gummed up. No room for any more. I'll have more to say on this next time. And please, that's not a threat. <laughs> um, it's not so much part two as developing my closing point about having more of God move in us and through us. And I'll leave you with this, I hope, tantalizing thought. As you know, over recent months, we've been in God's waiting room. But I believe Dr. Jesus may be ready to see us now. And so as the flight attendant gives a safety warning on the plane, brace, brace. <laughs> Thank you for listening so patiently and, and for being you. Wow, what a great word. So much to think about in that. Um, the first thing, I, I, it just <laughs> keeps rattling around my head. It's a very bad joke to say that with your neighbors, you're obviously showing that you've got good doctrine. Um, no, did no one else get that? Doc, doctrine, not doctrine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's obviously worse than even I thought it was. The chance to show your doctrine. And you did use the word dogma as well, which I was going to remind you of. Arwell shared something really profound and really um, touched a nerve, which I really feel passionately about. He ended by saying this lovely thing, which I've not thought about, Dr. Jesus ready to, to take us into the, you know, the room. And um, I don't know about you, that stirs something up within me because... I'm excited about what our church is going to be walking into in the weeks and the months to come. Um, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. It's going to probably be a little bit messy, a little bit chaotic. Um, it's going to be a little bit dysfunctional in places, like a normal family is. But we're going to see as we step out in faith, I believe, God move in, and, in us and through us in this world. Um, so yeah, buckle up, I think. Because the next season is going to be a very, very exciting and interesting one. It, it, just to follow on then, and I'm not going to take long to share this, but it's a good point to follow on from what Arwell shared. Um, because I was really stirred in my spirit about some of the things you shared, Arwell. Thinking about my own life and thinking about the roots and the foundations that I've got in my life. You know, it's easy to, um, to take people for granted, isn't it? And you only really miss them sometimes when they're not here. Well, I don't know if maybe some of you have noticed, Sheena and Kenny aren't here today. Sheena's on holiday. So Sheena, if you're watching this later, I hope you're enjoying your holiday. I hope you're not watching this until you're back at work, though. Um, but she's not here. You know one of the reasons I know she's not here? Because there's no flowers on the front table. Anyone else notice that when they came in to the church? There, I don't think there are anyone, unless someone sneakily put them on at like 10 to 11. There's no flowers on the front table, which Sheena, week after week, just faithfully buys some nice bunch of flowers and puts them on. As you can tell, when she's not here and it's left to me, the flowers aren't the first thing in my thought, right? <laughs> Hence the reason there's no flowers. What am I going on about flowers for? Well, here's the thing about every week, we put out a bunch of real flowers. It's not your cheapy plastic ones, I want you to know. Nice bunch of real flowers. They look amazing. You come in and you think, oh my goodness, it smells beautiful, looks wonderful. Well, as we come into this building the following week, what happens to those flowers that are sitting there? They just get all dried up, the water goes stale, and every leaf starts to shrivel, the, the buds just start to, you know, droop. And a week later, they look terrible, and you have to take them out, put them in a bin, put a new bunch of flowers in. Here's what society has been compared to at times. Society has been called a cut flower society because there are... The way our society likes to portray itself is like this bunch of flowers, and it's fresh, and it looks great. But what's happened is that in the last 30, 40, 50 years, perhaps, there's been huge societal changes, which has been like bringing a huge big pair of scissors through the stems of society. So what used to nourish, and what used to feed, and what used to provide them the food for that bloom, it's no longer connected to it. And society is holding this bunch of flowers thinking it kind of looks okay, 
it kind of looks like we've got law and order in place. It kind of looks like we're functioning like we always did, but it's not. And we can start to see the signs. Establishments that have been, and institutions that have been going on for centuries, millennia in some case, are shriveling, are dying, and we're starting to feel the effect of that because the stem isn't connected into the soil. It's a cut flower society. And you know what? The same thing can happen in our lives as Christians. I wonder if you would think of your life as a cut flower Christianity. I wonder if you feel like, if you're being honest, your spiritual life, does it feel like a bunch of flowers that has been sitting in the vase for too long? And it's just shriveling up. You're not getting any sustenance, any nourishment from the soil. I was listening to a book by R.T. Kendall, a really famous theologian that some of you will know, and in it, he talks about the importance of a few things, and this is what I want to leave you with just as we sing a song. R was talking about foundations, and the same thing, I think, different analogy, but a similar context, thinking about how flowers put down their roots and they build strong root systems. Well, how do you do that as a Christian to make sure you've got something solid there? Artie Kendall talks about Bible reading. Well, how often are you reading your Bible? Do you have a systematic daily Bible reading plan set up? If not, then it's going to be one of the things that cuts your stem. Now, trust me, I know the struggles that you have with Bible reading because I have them too. And so it's not like I'm trying to preach here without knowing the struggles. Believe me, I get it try to carve out the time to do that. I know what it's like. But if you don't have that in your life, you're going to find yourself shriveling up. Prayer is another one. How often are you spending time in, as an individual, as a family perhaps, coming together as a church? One of the convictions I have is I don't think our prayer life in this church is what it needs to be with what is coming forward in the future. So I think we're going to have to adjust that and tweak it because one thing's for sure, if we don't have a substantial prayer life, and um, the things that God wants to build on our church, aren't go it's not going to be a sufficient foundation, similarly in your own life. So Bible reading, prayer, and then I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but coming to church and just being with other Christians, that's such an important thing for rooting you in to something solid. So what my admonition is to you is don't live a cut flower Christian life. Make sure you root into the soil of God. Get a Bible reading plan set up. If you don't have a Bible, you don't have a Bible reading plan, come and speak to me right after the service. I'll give you a Bible to go home with, and I'll show you where you can get a plan for free. It's dead simple. Do it, and then pray together individually as a family, and then as a church, we'll be looking into how we can develop that, and then continue to prioritize coming together with our church family. It's so important. Don't neglect that. It's really, really, really important. So I'm going to just close by allowing us to sing a song now called Build My Life, which seems to be very aptly titled for what Arwell shared. But um, yeah, I want to just encourage you, just before we sing it, if you are in a place where you know you're not in the place you want to be, then as we sing this song, use it as a moment to connect with your creator and ask him, Lord, I know I'm not in this place I need to be to have a solid, vibrant foundation. But as I sing this song, I just pray that your Holy Spirit makes some changes in my life. So, uh, Dad, you want to share something? Okay. Come up to the mic and use the mic, because we'll pick it up in the, the recording. It, it was just that when Arbo was talking about uh, Jesus, like Dr. Jesus, and Grace and I were talking yesterday about how difficult it is to get a doctor's appointment these days. You know, you, you phone up and it's a, it's a phone appointment and thank God for it. But most of us are wanting to see the doctor face to face, if we're being honest. And I just sensed that the Lord in, in my spirit was just saying, you know, that we are going to be having face to face appointments with him. And all that that entails. And that's exciting. You know, we thank, we thank God for the way that he spoke to us in the past. But I think there's going to be a, a greater degree of intimacy. And God is going to come and it will be face to face. 
and that's quite awesome in itself. So just to leave that with you, so to look forward to those face-to-face -face encounters. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Let's just pray that over our church. Lord Jesus, we, we believe you just dropped this picture into our consciousness as a church this morning about how we are going to be entering a time where we get to see you in a new way, a fresh way, in a deeper way, a more personal and intimate way. And Lord, we are ready for that. We're desperate for it. We really are, Lord. We don't want to just play at being this nicey-nicey church, but rather we want to see this church as, you know, storming the, the gates of hell. We want to be bold. We want to be adventurous. We want to take risks, and we want to see you moving away in our, in our generation, in our lifetime. We read about how you moved in the past. We know you've done it then, and we just ask you to do it again. We ask you to do it now in our time, in our day. It's not something we can do in our own strength. We look to you, but as we humbly just submit ourselves into your hands, Lord, won't you just come and meet us afresh? Just fill us afresh. Pour your power over us and in us. We're desperate for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand, shall we? And let's just sing the song, uh, Build My Life, and just use it as a personal prayer to the Lord this morning. Your heart and lead me 
words over uh, our weeks that you will lead us in your love to those who are around us. And as our well shared, I pray that you just give us opportunities to speak to those close to us, whether it's neighbors, friends, school friends, work friends, random connections that we meet and opportunities that we come across. Give us the right words to say at the right time and let us be comfortable with taking our risk. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, it's been great to have you with us this Sunday, guys. Hang around for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. If anyone would like prayer for anything, come and I'll be hanging about here at the front. See you next Sunday.